Russian information operations are designed to accentuate and exaggerate the effects of war, but their strategies have been changing since the attack on the Kerch Bridge. Whereas Russian disinformation sources previously sought to spread confusion over their interference in Ukraine, now they use messaging to play up their military attacks on Ukrainian energy infrastructure and civilians. From supporting the strategy of plausible deniability, Russian info operations are now wielded as a terror weapon to project their ability to threaten, manipulate, coerce, and of course, to exaggerate their ability and willingness to project extreme violence and inflict economic chaos on their adversaries. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce and of course, our amazing guests. Adam Yur is a Russian and Ukrainian specialist in security, disinformation, strategic communications, and open source exploitation. He provides consultancy and policy advocacy to governments at most senior levels and other institutions and organizations. Adam was head of counter disinformation capability and assessment at the open source unit at the FCDO, part of the UK civil service, where he led a unit building the government's ability to leverage open source intelligence in foreign policy work. He has also worked as an expert analyst for the United States federal government, where he led the OSE Central Asia account and briefed senior government customers on issues relating to Central Asia, Russia and the former Soviet Union. Now, I should say here, I've been trying to get Adam onto the podcast for some months now, almost since the start of the war, but he has been in extremely high demand, providing his insights to decision makers. Uh, but finally, we get to do this, Adam. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to to vote your time to me. Uh, not at all. I think this is going to be absolutely fascinating. Now, let's let's get straight into the detail. Moscow has accompanied its invasion of Ukraine with very sort of targeted, manipulative media messaging, haven't they? But I think in some of the comments of yours that I've read, that has gone through a process of evolution as the war has unfolded. That's right. And I think it's important to state from the outset that these information operations will continue to evolve. Um, I've been watching uh, some of the Russian news today and the way that Russian state communicators are trying to get around some of the recent changes uh, among the military leadership, which I think has caught quite a few people by surprise. But I've tried to, whereas some commentators, um, sort of people that you will know of, um, try to analyze the changes through the prism of military strategy or political changes. I tried to look at that myself through the prism of information operations and specifically in terms of the supposed impact and reaction that Moscow is trying to have on various audiences, both at home and in Ukraine, in Europe also, and in America. And that's been the, the most interesting aspect I suppose of the latest 24 hours for me but I think what I'm trying to underline here is that these information operations and the way that uh, Moscow leverages its sources to try and um, I, I suppose encourage um, various reactions from different sort of audiences will continue to change and they I think they evolve very very quickly as I've said the um, or as you said in your very kind introduction, the, the most notable thing that's happened over the past few months has been this shift from plausible deniability, which uh, I think a term that um, many of your subscribers will be familiar with, to using information operations to try and accept the damage that Moscow is deliberately causing in Ukraine and try and accentuate the reaction there having various populations to... Um, that wants some destruction. And of course, there's, there's there's a whole range of threads going on. I mean, first of all, they want to uh, take the media in one direction when perhaps their military planning is going in another. Um, at the fall of Kherson, they, they put this sort of butcher of Syria in charge. My interpretation here was to take the rap for for Kherson uh, being lost. And now three months later, hey, presto, he's shoved to one side. He's done his job. 
He's, you know, taken the so-called blame for that uh, that loss, although and there's a number of interpretations of that. But at the same time, you've got a Russian regime which is moving from being pretty solid at the start of the war. I mean, no one would seriously think that there would be a challenge to Putin's rule or, or any kind of, sort of popular protest or whatever. And you're now facing an increasingly fragile regime with perhaps infighting start to emerge. So is it also the process of, uh, uh, you know, disinformation or uh, these sort of psyops that Russia's running is to perhaps paper over the cracks of internal divisions and possibly even sort of, uh, you know, a turf war between the elite? I think so. And as you'll know, um, we use, uh, we analyze media in different way in the way that Russian media works. But one of the things that's really important to do is build up over a period of time and period of years experience in a way that different sources uh, operate. Uh, the relationships that those sources owners have with various people within the Russian establishment and the way that those different media sources, sometimes competing media sources, push different agendas. And that's one of the things where um, a great deal of experience uh, and time is required to get a, a good understanding and a good sense of the way that um, different media do push those agendas. And as you say, uh, you can use that knowledge then to infer that um, inter elite differences and argumentation, which has happened over, oh, you, you have seen that, uh, cases of that over many years, but um, there are specific examples uh, of that now where um there does seem to be great attention between different groups within the elite um and i think uh, again events over the past 24 hours um really do point um to those differences as well and probably raise more questions and answers uh about what that means mm, you've got you've got the more traditional armed forces in Gerasimov, haven't you? You've got Wagner and Prigozhin and his sort of thuggish, uh, sort of mercenary privateers unit. Uh, and you've got Shoigu, who is basically an apparatchik, isn't he? He's not a, a traditional military man. And they're clearly sort of vying to, to, to either maintain or extend their control or, dare I say it, not to fall out of windows, which seems to be happening to an awful lot of people who fall out of favour. Um so you're you're trying to interpret the changes in narrative, the changes in tone, um, the messaging that appears across uh, Russian media sources, but also you're looking at specific channels and specific, you know, propagandists and so on, and seeing how their message change over time. So if we take this as a kind of product that you're working on. What then happens to that? I mean, this may this may not be a process that you can uh, you can shed light on, but would that help to shape uh, military planning and thinking? Would people in Ramstein, for instance, use some of this intelligence to try and shape their thinking and planning about how to support Ukraine, how to uh, you know uh, extend and improve sort of NATO's resilience, government policy? I'm assuming there's lots of different applications for these intelligence products that you you work. On. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I haven't really worked in the military sphere myself. I have worked uh, alongside military analysts for military customers, but my work over the past uh, couple of decades has been predominantly uh, for political planners. Um, over the past year or so within the Foreign Office, um, my work evolved more to support strategic communications as that became uh, a more important focus of the FCDO's mission regarding Ukraine. One thing I think you, uh, it's really interesting that you raise there as a, as a meta question is how open source intelligence is used and that um, has evolved a lot as you're aware, certainly over, over the past decade. I, I have worked in the, the classified space uh, as well. So I have, um, I have experience of uh, the way that classified intelligence is used. Um, I do have experience of the way that open source intelligence is used. 
But I think within that one thing that's really interesting and it's something that governments and the industry haven't got um, a good handle on yet is the relationship between classified and open source intelligence and the relationship between governments and in, in industry in building up intelligence and then using that through a established government architecture in an effective method that does actually inform policy planning. But as I said, the focus of my work really over the past 12 months or so, certainly since the um, this stage of Russia's war against Ukraine began, has been more on the strategic communication side and building up an understanding of Russian messaging, trying to understand the intent and supposed impact of what Moscow wants when it puts out its um, messaging and trying to use that to inform very senior government customers within the UK mm -hmm. and also within our allies uh, about how to take, firstly, how to understand really what Moscow is doing in its information operations and then help government tailor their uh, track comms campaigns accordingly. And it must be really challenging because we know one of the features of Russian propaganda, it's a little bit like, you know, marketing in a way, which is the field I, uh, for my sins, work in. And that is that you're constantly testing different messages. You don't actually know what's going to work. So you test everything, even if those things are contradictory. And you initiate sort of change with a great level of frequency. When something's not working, you change it up, you try something else. Um, rather than looking at Russian propaganda and trying to define some kind of objective truth or some kind of philosophy behind it, should we not see it rather, you know, more as marketing, which is sort of testing different messaging to see what flies based on what your objective is? And for your, you know, profession, how difficult is it to keep track of something that is constantly changing and evolving? It is very hard. And what this does require, which, uh, I, again, is something that um, I pushed the UK government towards, and I think over the past three, four years, our capability in this regard has improved considerably. But it does require a a rounded and very deep understanding of Russian policy, uh, an understanding of Russian information operations, and also specific aspects of different sciences need to be brought in this. One thing that studies of information operations lack and we try to um, mitigate in the foreign office was an element of behavioral science. Because I think lots of teams uh, within governments, within industry around the world are getting a, a good handle on data and being able to collect and parse uh, and analyze data, certainly regarding social media manipulation. Um, they're getting better at being able to merge a data understanding with uh, an understanding of Russian politics, Russian culture, Russian society and trying to fuse that but there's the thing that's really missed off in that uh, within governments and within lots of non-governmental groups is an understanding of impact both in terms of the intent that Russia wants to have in its audiences uh, and also in the um, the definite reaction uh, among um, different audiences to um, Russian messaging. Uh, you've raised Telegram, which is very helpful, but Telegram is a relatively new media. And I do have lots of suspicions about the particularities of the way that Telegram works and the way that tele uh, messages put out on various Telegram channels are absorbed and understood and consumed by various audiences. But there's still a lot of behavioral science that needs to be put into that. So I think there is a, a lot of marketing um, about that. Uh, as well, you know, Russian assets have got the latitude to try different techniques. They uh, It's very cost effective for them to try one type of information operation, try and see if that works. 
if they don't seem to be getting the intended effect of that, then they're free to try other methods. I think that there's also a deliberate malicious aspect among so, some Russian actors as well in a way that they use their information and operations that sometimes they're not meant to deceive or disorientate. They're deliberately meant to just cause harm and also to waste government time. Mm. Um, I, I'm not uh, at all uh, privy to what's going on in the Foreign Office at, at the moment, but as you, you'll be aware, there's some very sad news about uh, the potential fate of two British citizens in Ukraine at the moment. We have in the past seen various Telegram channels put out very distressing messages about UK citizens in the past, which have been demon uh, proven to be false. But my suspicion is that those various Telegram channels have just put out messaging to hurt the UK citizens' families to also tie up the, the Foreign Office and a lot of human resources in trying to investigate that work um, and also trying to dismay UK citizens, trying to dismay and demoralise Ukrainians and also, of course, try and discourage other uh, people from the UK and the European countries from going to Ukraine to help the Ukrainians. And Telegram is an interesting one, isn't it? Because whereas, uh, you know, Twitter accounts and so on, it's now relatively easy to identify when Russian state actors or their methodology is behind certain narratives, whether it's people who uh, are voluntarily doing that and they're getting on the bandwagon of those messages. I'm thinking of a lot of the sort of Vatnik trolls who duel with 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 NAFO on Twitter. You can you can pretty much see the messaging and a mile away, and 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 often it is uh, disinformation based on fairly blatant and disprovable lies. Um, however, Telegram is slightly different, isn't it? And it's not quite clear whether the state is behind fully or partially behind many of the hundreds of military bloggers that have appeared. It's not clear exactly what their affiliation is, because many of them actually seem to be supportive of uh, Russian imperialism. Um, and they're actually critical of Putin for not being effective in the war, not prosecuting the war successfully, not against the war at all. Um, but sometimes you read into those voices a levels of criticism. And even though, you know, it's detestable opinion and passion, nonetheless, those speakers seem to believe in what they're saying, whereas much of the rest of the propaganda that we're talking about has a kind of postmodern complete lack of belief in itself you know it's like a big game whereas these guys you know many of them seem to be quite genuine do you think from what you've seen i know you will have studied a lot of these do you think they are partially under the control of the government instigated by the government or is this the emergence of a almost uncontrollable sphere um which the government tolerates but perhaps you know uh, has limits to how much it can control and guide it that is one of the questions which I've been going through um, certainly over the, the past um, few weeks, past couple of months. But I think it is fascinating. And it is one of the big questions about Russian information operations um, during the war at this moment in time. And I know that other people have um, been working on this and there is some very good material out there on that. Um, my answer that question is I, I don't know but I'll um, add some things that, that I, I do know some things that I don't know uh, and also tell you what I think um, I don't know the extent to which the Kremlin controls Telegram however I suspect that it does have some influence I think it has some access to Telegram data although I cannot say to what extent um, how that relationship might work um, and how the Kremlin uses that data. Um, one thing that you do find is that individuals who put on uh, messages critical of the war uh, on social media and other platforms on VK and Instagram um, are very quickly found and in some cases brought to severe justice. 
And as you say, the mill bloggers group on a Telegram seems to be immune to that kind of retribution and control by the Kremlin. And I, I don't know why that is. Um, I read, I think it was an Institute for Studies sort of War report that suspects there's around 500 members of the military blogs community at the moment. Within that group, there are a range of um, varying opinions there. Um, there are various levels of support for Putin for various military commanders. Um, I think a, a good kind of screenshot or case study for the, the reaction um, or the way that military bloggers operate would be the reaction to the Mikhevka bombing uh, on New Year's morning. And there's a whole range of um, opinions expressed throughout the mill blog communities, either in support of the uh, commanders, in support of the mobilised troops. Um, some of them even praised Ukrainian superiority and the um, supposed best to battle readiness of the Ukrainians over the, the Russians, um, some use that opportunity to um, accuse Russian soldiers of being lax and um, trying to encourage them to become more alert. Um, Gherkin, um, Igor Strelkov stroke, um, Gherkin is sometimes classed as a member of this Mill Plus community. I'm not sure if he is or whether he's a unique voice because of his um, explicit criticism of Putin personally, which I think is one of the limits that the mill blog community has. Um, the mill blog community, as you're aware, it generally does not criticise Putin personally. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Kremlin might permit the mill blog community to exist in a way that it deflects issues um, and problems with the war away from Putin and points them onto very specific incidents, which then can be attributed to individual uh, commanders. As you just said, uh, I've not seen anyone within that mill blog community, however I want to define it, actually criticise the, the point of the war. I, I think they're, they're unified by their uh, communal desire to see a, a, a Russian victory in Ukraine, although I don't think they can agree amongst themselves over what form they want that supposed victory to take. And this is very Trumpian in a way, isn't it? Because no matter what your base says, as long as they say it with passion and don't touch the dear leader, it seems they have a lot more leeway than than anybody else does to express their their opinions. But this isn't unique, is it? I mean, in civilian times, uh, well, the, the the short periods where uh, Russia hasn't been at war in the last 20 years, um, the same process is in place when, say, uh, you know, something happens uh, in a particular region or oblast, they deflect all criticism away from the Kremlin uh, by, you know, really targeting it at the uh, the governors of the oblasts, at uh, apparatchiks, local politicians. They're very good at deferring blame. That's not a new strategy. Yes, that, that's right. And I'm not a, a Russian historian, but you'll be aware of the... Um... The good farm, bad boy theory of Russian history that this has been a, a long standing aspect of Russian society that has gone back to centuries. That when these problems do emerge, uh, people are, um, do blame and are encouraged to blame local leaders rather than the infallible overall leader himself. It's bad information rather than a, a, bad, a, a bad leader. Oh. It's fascinating to hear that a lot more attention is being paid to Russian info ops. But let's take the period 2014 to 2021, because Ukraine was already at war. Ukraine was already invaded at that point. We'd also had Chechnya. We'd had uh, the Georgian War, Russia's intervention in Syria. It's not like there wasn't something to observe. And then we had, you know, the uh, the active measures that were in my view, clearly in place from 2016 onwards um, against the US and the UK to try and stoke division. 
and take existing domestic issues, which were genuine issues, and just pour petrol on the flames of those. Were the mainstream media and even the sort of um, the community that you work within, is it true to say that really, you know, we dropped the ball in that period? We weren't quite as um, aware of and monitoring Russian info ops as intently as we should have done before 2022? Yeah, I think in the UK that that's definitely the case, and um, I'll be slightly worried about going into political debates. But um, if we look at, for example, um, BBC monitoring, which um, was a a very good resource of examining Russian open source messaging and and also analysing that, if we look at the way that that funding is being cut. Uh, over the years, even while the issue of Russian information operations and the way that messaging affected the UK po- population became more uh, a, a, of an issue. I, th- I think there's a, a, a problem in that. Um, I, I think the US has done better as, as far as I can tell, because um, the US government does have a lot more money, but it has, uh, as far as I can tell increased um, or at least maintained its work on Russian information operations over uh, um, the past decade or so. It's transformed the way that it's examined um, information operations by moving that work from the open source sphere into the classified sphere, which I think is a question really for the UK and other governments. But um, there were a lot more things that the UK government um, should have been doing, certainly from 2014 onwards. Um, I'm not a politician, but I would have wanted to see a different political response um, and maybe different responses to the initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Um, the UK chain of uh, the UK government changed its position um, and started to, to really build its capability against Russian information in 2018 after the Salisbury attack and the accompanying information attack against the UK there. And that is the time where I joined the, the Foreign Office, and that's where I started to work to. Um, really lead in building up that capability. Foreign Office um, certainly um, started to scale up its work on Russian information operations after the um, the, the Salisbury attack uh, against um, Skripal in 2018. And there was an accompanying information attack, which was very difficult at the time for the UK government to cope with and they really needed to build up a um, a new capability at pace to analyse that uh, uh, information attack in terms of being able to understand the data but also being able to analyse the data through the prism of Russian policy, Russian intent when it became clear, certainly to uh, me in October 2021, that Russia was going to um, invade the rest of, U- of Ukraine, although we w- w- weren't sure of the extent uh, of that attack, we um, again really did try and scale up our response in, in different ways in preparation for that attack. Um, and since the full-scale invasion started at the um, end of February 2022, um, we've been trying to, again, build up that capability um, and also try and fuse better the analysis of Russian information operations Um, with our strategic communication capability and be able to leverage that understanding of Russian information um, operations to um, help improve the stratcom side of our work. And there's been an interesting shift, isn't there, in the intent behind uh, uh, Russian propaganda. So 
on the domestic audience, up until uh, the war this year, and indeed up until conscription, which happened a couple of months ago, the main intent was to sow indifference, uh, to convince people through a variety of means that it's pointless to take action. Uh, you know, even if they oppose the regime, it's going to come to absolutely nothing. And that's kind of how they won in Belarus, convince people that it's pointless to protest. And if you do, we'll get you and get your family and all your friends and just just don't go there. Um, so after conscription, they're now trying to turn that around and get people to take some kind of action, some kind of nationalist inspired action to save the motherland, etc. And that's a bit of a a push isn't it from 20 years of propaganda based on stoking indifference to to um, trying to drive action yet in the west it's kind of flipped on its head hasn't it they've gone from trying to get our societies to be divided and arguing and so on at the moment their prime objective is to actually prevent action which is to stop us supporting ukraine stop people volunteering and going there stop people from sending munitions stop Germany from unleashing the uh, the leopards, which is, you know, the big thing on, on um, social media. And rightly so, you know, Ukraine needs this this gear. So that's an interesting kind of flip, isn't it? Yes, it, it is. And um, the question of the, um, I suppose, impending new wave of construction, which might happen over the next few months, um, the Ukrainians suspected that it might happen already in, in early January. It, it ha hasn't yet, uh, as you know. I think will tell us more about um, the direction that um, Russia is heading in, in terms of its plans for the, the next stage of its invasion. Um, that, again, is coupled with the ridiculous, as your watchers of Russian television will be aware. Um, I did watch a, a bit of Vladimir um, Pakash, if time will tell, I think it was this morning, which um, gave through its daily um, explanation and opinions on the war. Um, but one of the um, most disappointing and shocking segments which i shouldn't really as someone who's been watching russian tv for 25 years should be disappointed or shocked with was um, an explanation for why russia has had to invade ukraine which was in russian terms of course because of um transgender issues in New York and the fact that um, the New York Times has recently released a um, a spread of transgender or genderless clothing that people can now work to uh, wear to the workplace and it had some images um, which it said were taken from the New York Times of a man wearing um, a very smart work dress um, it also showed some clips which um, it managed to find really um, scraping through American TikTok of uh, what it said were transgender children. Um, that, in their words, is why Russia had to in invade Ukraine. It's, uh, we all know that's ridiculous, but that is the kind of thing that I, I think will carry on for their uh, foreseeable future in uh, um, in Russia, certainly while the, um, those people are in control of uh, uh, television channels. Um, in the West, um, I, I, perfect, I, I totally agree with what you said. Um, one thing that um, I've tried to um, point out in some of my recent social media outputs is the fact that information operations have a, a a limited shelf life and it's something that you've also mentioned that um the russians can try something once or uh, a few times and if it doesn't work they, they do have the, the latitude to change it but one of the things as you're aware that they were doing towards the, the end of last year was um target europeans with fear that they wouldn't have enough energy uh, to get them through what would be a, a very, very cold winter. Uh, it's one of the things that they were targeting also against the Ukrainians to try and demoralise the Ukrainians and make them worried that they wouldn't be able to survive the winter. Um, the winter is coming 
to it and then so we can probably um look to a new stage of um what the russians will do next in their information operations uh going into the spring and that was countered incredibly effectively by uh zelensky's speech wasn't it you know with the laos electricity or without russia without you and then he listed a whole range of things which uh Russian propaganda is claiming they're going to deprive the West and Ukraine of. And it's an extraordinary sort of powerful and emotive response to that. Um, I think that's been one of the strengths of Ukraine in the disinformation war, which I think they profoundly lost in the 2014 period up to the present, up until the war last year. But Ukraine has definitely taken the lead by weaponizing the truth rather than weaponizing lies and do you think that's a a fair uh simplistic summary i i don't want to be critical of ukraine and the incredible work that um the ukrainian government is doing they, they do get um some latitude for the way that they p- present their case um I think that's worth pointing out objectively. Subjectively, I, I would give them that latitude. Um, more seriously, though, um, the, the Ukrainians do have a very good case to make, and, and they do make it very well. Um, I do fear, though, that um, when we say that Ukraine is winning the information war, there are probably other parts of the global audience where Russia is still making its case very strongly and it does have allies and it is finding audiences that really aren't as sympathetic to the Ukrainian cause uh, as we might be. So I would just caution against a um, an assumption that everyone in the world is um, on our side uh, because they're not. And I think in terms of stratcoms, there is still a lot of work that governments um, in Europe and, and in the Americas need to do in reaching out to other countries and trying to push them around. And so, I mean, that's clearly, uh, I, I understand what you mean there. And certainly, whenever you pop up on social media and you say anything critical of whether it be Middle Eastern uh, and especially Indian policy uh, towards Russia, you get a barrage of, uh, you know, and much of that might be organic, but it does reflect perhaps the effectiveness of of Russian messaging getting through. Do you detect, and this may be outside your area of expertise, but do you detect any governments actually carrying water for the Kremlin as well? Are any governments doing information operations in support of um Russia, perhaps outside of Iran and North Korea, which we can perhaps assume. Um, but is anyone else sort of uh, layering on their own sort of information operations on top of, uh, you know, Russian messaging? I don't know for sure, to be honest. Uh, you'll be aware that there is overlap of intent. Um, there's been a, a recent report uh, into Chinese information operations um, and trying to pull out formal agreements between Chinese news agencies and Russian news agencies um, and trying to uh, identify a specific intent to collaborate there. Um, we have seen for um, a number of years now that um, the interests of some governments do overlap with Russia's in terms of attacking the United States uh, in terms of um, pushing back against sanctions. Um, China is one of those. It, it, um, Iran, as you said, um, there are probably governments in Africa and Asia and South America um, that um, do um, are not as um, supportive of, for example, sanctions against Russia uh, as we might be. Um, I don't know, to be absolutely honest, um, if those governments have actually launched um, specific state-mandated information operations Mm -hmm. to support Russia, but uh, there is overlap in certain cases. And in the case of of China, there is um, highly likely some degree of cooperation in certain areas, but... um, I'm not at all a Chinese expert, but um, I, I suspect that um, the Chinese government would, um, I think they put their interests first. 
Yes, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, and that doesn't mean putting all their eggs in, in Russia's basket either, because they must be fairly appalled at their allies' uh, incompetence in executing the war. And we saw that quite publicly. I mean, out of all your social media stuff you've been putting out, your very sort of, um, you know, very sort of reflective uh, post about how, you know, this information sphere operates. Something really sort of jumped out at me was kind of fascinating. And it's a, a Soviet theory of uh, information warfare called reflexive control. Reflexivne uh, upravlenia, I think it is. And I'd like, you know, you to potentially to explain what that is, because that's an extraordinary theory, isn't it, of uh, how propaganda can create an entire alternative universe. And uh, it has kind of echoes of Adam Curtis and um, and the documentaries he put out uh, on that same kind of theme. Um, but to an extent, you know, the Soviet Union was one huge experiment in creating a physical and alternative mental space for its population. Um how does that translate into modern Russian uh, info operations? I'll start by saying I have um, my work in this area is um, really just starting. There's um, a lot more research that I want to do on, um, as you said, reflexive control, um, reflexive no Um It is a um, Soviet theory of behavioral science. Um, I'm not a behavioral scientist, but um, was developed um, in the 1960s uh, and 1970s um, and has been used there to try and uh, um, exploit mathematical principles to understand individuals' responses to um, certain stimuli. Um, The way that I want to push this research is to examine more the Russian theory that if you create a specific worldview in which your target audience operates, then you in turn create external stimuli in which you can encourage your target to behave without your target being aware that they're actually being manipulated. And as I said, there's a lot more work that I want to to do on this and apply these theories more to um, Russian information operations at the moment. But I think testing this, it does seem to work at the moment that the Russian government has spent a long time creating a specific information space in which Russians operate it. it's been able to build up a specific uh, and uh, um, fairly successful uh, worldview in which um, the Russian domestic audience uh, as a target behaves. I think it's tried to apply that to um, a large extent to other Russian speaking areas um, of other Russian speaking audiences. So I think it's tried to apply the theory to Ukraine, um, to Belarus, um, other Russian audiences uh, around the world. Um, This is, uh, as well as the actual specifics of the way that um, reflective control works, I think there's also something about the methodology um, of our counter disinformation work that needs to be improved which is our understanding of Soviet uh, and Russian methodologies and their theorizing of the way that they expect information operations to uh, be conducted and the way that they um, understand information to um, uh, how it influences um, specific audiences. And in that, uh, one of my concerns is that uh, there is lots of work within the UK US government that's very data orientated um, that's tried to analyze information operations as specific anomalies in social media behavior and within that it's only looked at specific social media platforms Um, the um, the main US platforms such as Twitter Facebook um, to some extent, um, YouTube. Um, But there is a lot of good work that 
um, governments that are geographically closer to Russia have done over the, the past few years on reflective control and Russian information operations. Uh, um, I think there, there is some shared legacy there of, of Soviet thinking, but um, so the Ukrainian government have this expertise and they have this archive knowledge, which um, I think they, they are bringing to the fore. Um, they did a joint paper um last year on this with um i think it was the nato stratcom center of excellence which was a, a very good read um i'll try and fish out the, the details if any of your surprises want a, a link to that um i think the point there is that in order for us in the uk and in other countries to continue to progress our understanding of information operations we do need to collaborate more closely with um Ukrainian academics and government understanding of information operations, draw on their archives and be able to incorporate that in our work as we go forward. Because I think that's been a uh, one of the big gaps in our government work so far. And that, yeah, I mean, that touches an interesting point. It's one of the reasons why I created this channel is because uh, I had the uh, feeling that Ukrainians have had eight years of experience of being under assault, informational assault by Russia, and they have developed a variety of techniques and technologies, as well as societal and educational resilience in order to counter that. Um, and uh, I thought there's definitely stuff we can sort of learn from them. And that's why we've got so many Ukrainians on the channel, because it helps to understand the Russian mindset. It helps to understand how their society has built institutions and resilience and the qualities of self-organization that are required to counter these malign state uh, actors. Um, my last question really feeds off of what you said uh, a second ago, and that is that we face the prospect of a malignant, malign, aggressive Russia uh, for potentially decades to come. But if it loses this war comprehensively and catastrophically, it may also be a Russia that harbors extreme you know, resentment. Um, so the kind of work you're doing, the kind of work that really only sort of got going um, and is scaling up in the last year, um, this is going to be potentially needed for many decades to come you know what do you think needs to go into it because the, the worst thing would be for the war to end ukraine to be victorious and then we try to normalize relations with russia before it has shown contrition before it has reformed itself um so what do you see as the future of of the kind of work you're doing sadly i think this work needs to continue it needs to evolve um there are there, there's still many things that we need to be doing. One is, as I've said, draw on the um, long understanding that um, Ukrainians and other countries have of the, the theories of um, Russian and Soviet information operations, be able to draw, the, draw those in. Um, I think there needs to be this sounds a bit harsh, but I think there needs to be greater professionalization of the OSINT sphere and certainly the way that OSINT work is used to uh, understand and counter Russian disinformation. Um, this type of work does require years and years of experience and it requires knowledge of several aspects of the way that Russian society, politics uh, and media work. Um, and it needs a better relationship between um, data technicians and people who work on the, the technical aspects of this information and Russian spe specialists. Um, I think it needs a greater sensitivity to um, psychology and behavioral studies, because I think that's one of the things that was missing really in the run up to the uh, renewed invasion in February 2022. Um, there, there was a very dry but abstracted uh, analysis of um, Russian social media patterns, Russian mainstream media patterns. Um, 
in the run-up to the 24th of February of last year, which I think um, in some respects deliberately excluded the human factor and our um, allowances for taking into account the, the human psychological factor in what Moscow was planning to do. And also, I think it's um, in the behavioural science and psychological sphere, it needs greater um, understanding of impact. Uh, I think, as I've said, that's one of the um, biggest things that we're missing. Um, we need to be able to understand better the uh, impact of um, social media, um, especially on very various audiences. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the way that various Telegram channels um, affect people's behaviour. Um, and, and also, I, I think going forward, there, there is still a, a lot of work that we need to do on um, other platforms other than Twitter, um, Facebook. It, uh, um, I'll say twi Twitter and Facebook. Um, there because those have been some of the focus of some organizations because um they're seen as the biggest ones and also twitter um uh, twitter data has been um easiest to get hold of but there's still a lot of work that we need to do um on instagram and, and youtube as video media and the way that they impact audiences but also on um other um I don't like to use mainstream, but um, the other minor, maybe non US social media channels that, that are being used, um, such as RuTube, um, uh, Telegram, obviously, as I've just said, um, VK uh, and uh, other channels. This is a fascinating, evolving field, and it, it, it's one which is absolutely essential. So, uh... I think uh, you know, for many years to come, we're going to need to evolve the kind of resilience that uh, Ukrainian society is is now building into its education systems, its public institutions, and you know, tolerating and encouraging the self organizing capabilities which Ukrainians have shown they're they're extremely adept at. Um, Adam, I want to say thank you so much for for making the time to share your experience and knowledge in this this field, and. Um, do go and back on because I'm sure if we were to speak in a few months' time, uh, a lot of stuff will have changed and moved on. Uh, but I really appreciate you uh, joining the channel. Likewise, thank you very much for your time.